Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview, Days in Hicksville, New York, 25th of June, 2003, 8.45 a.m. The interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? I was born in New York City, uh, May 27th, 1970. Then your full name, I'm sorry. Harry L. Zerota. S-E-R-O-T-T-A. Okay. Uh, what was your educational background prior to entering military service? Graduated from high school and had one year at Brooklyn College. But because of the uh, severe depression at the time, I was forced to leave. Mm -hmm. get it. Okay. Um, do you recall where you were and your, re your emotional or your response to... Uh, what happened on December 7th? Oh, I can recall that very easily. I was listening to a New York Giants football game with my uh, brother-in-law, and I heard that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor, and I said, where the heck is Pearl Harbor? Do you remember how you felt about this when the, the Japanese had attacked? Truthfully, no. I, I couldn't say that I can recall any type of emotion at the time. Okay. Um, did you uh, enlist or were you drafted? Drafted. Okay. Um, so you were drafted into the Army Air Corps? Yes. Okay. Um, it when... had been called the Air Corps at that time mm -hmm. and later changed to the uh, Army Air Force. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, where was your induction? Grand Central Palace in, in uh, I believe it was on Lexington Avenue in the city. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could you tell us uh, where you went for basic and what kind of training you had and so on? Oh, surely. Uh, from there, we went uh, on a bit of December day to Camp Upton. That was in New York, mm -hmm. and just waited to be uh, sent to Atlantic City, where we took basic training, such as it was. Never saw a rifle, never saw a gun, never saw a pistol. All we did was march, and march, and march, and go through the gas chamber mm -hmm. to see how proficient we would be with the um, gas mask. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, now you became an aerial gunner, it said in your form, where did you, did you receive any specialized training for that and where? Oh yes. Now, uh, did you pick that or did they pick that for you? That, that was, uh, we were asked to sign a paper that listed EEC, this is clear in my mind, and ECC, I apologize. Enlisted combat crew, and uh, at that time it seemed like a great, great uh, outing, because I had never flown prior to that, and uh, from there we went to Amarillo, Texas, where we had to know the, uh, where we studied mechanics and the general operation of the plane. From there we went to uh, Kingman, Arizona in the middle of the desert where we practiced air-to-air -air gunnery which was a lot of fun but being city boys I don't think I had ever shot a gun other than at Coney Island, one of those BB guns. Mm -hmm. There we were taught how to uh, track, and lead. We practiced skeet, which is a great, great sport. And then we had to do skeet from the back of a moving truck. And of course, being young and stupid and innocent, we raced like maniacs. But it was a lot of fun. Now, did, Getting ready for the real stuff. Did you end up in the ball turret by any chance? No. No. I was uh, appointed 
engineer. When we hit the combat zone, I would fly the top turret. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of plane were you in? B-17. B-17, okay. All right. The plane that helped win the war. All right. Um, when were you assigned to a crew? And where? We were assigned to a crew out in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. Is that where you picked your plane up? No. No? Believe it or not, we went overseas by boat. Oh, you did? Okay. We were, uh, being in the Air Force, we had somehow or other, we liked to feel we were choice. And I and two others shared a magnificent stateroom. Now, when you went across, uh, were you in a convoy? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, were there other air units on the well, just yours? Just about, I, uh, I would say maybe a hundred Air Force personnel, mm -hmm. and mostly at that time the uh, services were segregated, and I, I would say there must have been maybe 10,000 uh, African-American troops on board. Did you, were you segregated from them? Or? No, not no. at all. Mm -hmm. Not at all, no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just had the choice accommodations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, where did you land in England? We landed in Gurak, Scotland. From Gurak, Scotland, you have to understand some of this is becoming a little hazy. That's okay. That uh, from Gurak, we went to a place called The Wash, which overlooks a bay or something in England for five days of strenuous target practice. Mm -hmm. When did you finally pick, your, pick a plane up? Uh, after the five days, we were assigned to uh, the 379th Bomb Group at Kimbolton, England, which is actually very close to Bedford, a fairly large size mm -hmm. city. Okay. Um, now, did you use the same plane all the time, and did your crew stay together? Or? Generally speaking, we did. Mm -hmm. Did you get to name a plane? We did. What was the name of your plane? And, a play on words. The pilot, who was a hell of a nice guy, who didn't take being an officer too seriously, was Jimmy Spratt, S-P-R-A-T-T. So we sort of got together and as paying homage to him, we named it the Strataliner, a takeoff on the TWA Strataliner. And we were allowed to paint uh, an insignia on it. What, what kind of insignia did you put on there? A shooting star. Uh-huh. Uh, did you uh, decorate your jackets at all? Yes. How, what did they look like? The uh, a B-17 and uh, the word Spratalina above it. Do you still have your jacket? The jacket, minus, and notice I said minus, minus the painting, now at the uh, Republic Airport in the city, uh, in uh, Nassau County mm -hmm. here, at the uh, American Air Power Museum. What happened to the painting? I had kept the jacket in the basement. I live out in Nassau, mm -hmm. very damp and it got moldy. Uh, I brought it into one of these leather refinishing places and they said they could not guarantee that they would maintain the quality of the painting. They didn't. Wow. <laughs> okay, um, could you uh, tell us about some of your missions? I know you said you had 35 missions. Yes. Could you tell us about some that kind of stand out more than others? or? Well, the first mission was over Merseburg, or in German, Merseburg. 
and uh, that was very rough. That was our inter introduction or induction to uh, flack. Flack that was so thick you felt you could walk on it. But I believe that and Munich directly after that for what it's worth, at home, I have a journal that I kept, including the clippings from the stars and stripes of each mission. This I promised my grandson when I pass on. Okay. Um, did, were you, was your plane ever seriously hit or? Yes. Yes, we did. We uh, were unfortunate enough to lose a, a bombardier. I believe his name was Lang. He just flew this particular mission. And uh, his, he got it badly. His head was almost severed. On another mission, the navigator who was Marcus Riga or Rege, R E G E R, lived in South Carolina, Camden, South Carolina, got a huge, huge chunk of flak lodged in his head. He recovered. Of course, he was sent to a military hospital in. England. From there he was transferred to the States here and we maintained a sort of a relationship by sending an occasional letter and uh, a Christmas card. Is he still living? Or he Passed away a couple of days before Christmas. Okay. Um, now I notice you said you made two radio broadcasts in German. When was that and what was yes. the story behind that? The story behind that is very interesting. Uh, number one, and high school, German was my major. When I went to college, Brooklyn College, for one year, German, I thought German might be my major because I could not afford to go to NYU and study advertising, which was the dream of my life. However, returning from one mission, uh, there was a notice on the bulletin board, and I approached the first sergeant, asked him what it was all about. He says, well, they want someone with a knowledge of German. I said, well, I haven't used the language in ten years or so and things become dim and you become rusty. He said, that's the type we want. We don't want a professional actor. Would you like to go to London and make a couple of broadcasts? Always looking for an adventure. I said, why not? And he told me to report to a Colonel Lyon L-Y-O-N-S. Well, it was a long trip to London, and I got there during the night, went to the Red Cross. Following morning, I got up, shaved, went to see Colonel Lyons. Colonel Lyons was somebody who people of my generation would know immediately. He and his wife, were both well-known movie stars. Colonel Ben Lyons, his wife was B.B. Daniels, musical comedy star, beautiful voice, almost at the start of talking pictures. Well, as a kid, I had pneumonia, which at that time was very dangerous. And uh, I had to lay in bed for many, many weeks. And my, uh, 
my apartment, our apartment at that time, overlooked the old Biograph movie studios in the Bronx. Ben Lyons at that time played the part in a movie of uh, Matador and they had some kind of an animal dressed with horns and he was actually gored by this animal and I was watching them shoot this scene he was gored by this animal they put him on a stretcher carried him around the corner to a maternity <laughs> hospital and of course I reminded him of that and he put a staff car at my disposal <laughs> the fact remains that uh, at that time he was in the uh, British uh, service because he and his wife had moved to England very interesting something and uh, then to get back to the original story I was told to appear at the old Gaumont British Studios and there I was interviewed by this anti-Nazi young attractive charming beautiful young lady and I I required a little help when I had a fish for, for certain words, but I came through, I believe, with fine colors. The original transcript, printed transcript, is now in the museum the, uh, at Republic Airport. I have a copy of it because it was beginning to fade somewhat, and I wanted it my grandchildren ever feel they'd like to display it somewhere. Do you, um, what was the purpose behind this, just to give a GI's Propaganda. version of... Propaganda. Propaganda? Of course. Okay. Um, when did you return to uh, the States? Uh... It was a cold, blustery, bitter December day, that much I remember, and I immediately went for two things, pickles and milk. <laughs> pickles that Uncle Sam didn't provide, and milk that the British did not allow GIs to have for some reason, because the milk was unpasteurized at the time, and introducing it to us would be introducing unfavorable bacteria. Now, how many missions did you end up flying? 35. 35. Yeah. Um, okay, when you uh, were you discharged as soon as you returned, now you returned home in 44. 44, when yes. You... No. From there, I think I ate too much pickles and too much milk. I developed a kidney stone while I was home. And the, I, my, was, stayed at my folks. My wife was there with me for a few days. We stayed there. And, uh, an incomplete hospital was only perhaps two or three blocks away that the army had taken over and completed and I was sent to that hospital. I was there for about two weeks and from there I went to Atlantic City and my wife was allowed to stay a, uh, a week or ten days. Things are beginning to get somewhat dim now and uh, I was supposed to be shipped out one week went by, two weeks went by, three weeks went by. I got tired of eating strawberries for breakfast with heavy cream so thick you could cut it with a knife. And I started to ask questions. Nobody knew I was there. I could have walked out. They couldn't find my records. Well, after 
searching through convention hall, which was uh, which is a monster of a place, something like Madison Square Garden. We finally found it, and they shipped me by private room on the train to Denver, Colorado, Lowry Field. Now, why they sent me there is something I could never figure out. Lowry Field is the headquarters of all Air Force photography. I never owned a camera. At any rate, after three days, somebody realized I didn't belong there, and I was sent to uh, Shepherd Field in Wichita Falls, Texas. Now, what rank were you at that point? At that point, I was a tech sergeant, one under a master sergeant. You can't be, at that point, you couldn't be a master sergeant and fly because of the pace scale. We would be higher, uh, we would be earning more than a second lieutenant. And uh, we were there, supposed to outfit the old constellations. You know, I want to amend that. I want to amend my statement. It was not at Wichita Falls. It was uh, at um, the field in West Palm Beach. And from there, we went to Wichita Falls, where the Army was, where the Air Force was just beginning to get R 4s, the first helicopters, and we studied mechanical on that, fooled around mostly, went back to Morrison Field in West Palm Beach, Florida, and we were there a short while. We were supposed to outfit these, uh, I believe they call them the Constellation, it had triple tail mm -hmm. for hospital uh, planes. However, there were no tools available. The Air Force built nose docks where the planes could be brought in, four hoists and everything. But if you needed a screwdriver or a wrench, there was none available. So all we did was smoke all day long, which of course I stopped doing many, many years ago. And then, of course, the atom bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and we all got wild. And at that point, uh, Uncle Sam started to discharge us. Now, when did you get married? Oh, I was married uh, before I went into oh, service, wow. yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, we were married on a June 15th, 1941. And uh, Pearl Harbor was December seventh, nineteen forty-one. Okay. Um, do you did you? Uh, I just asked you a couple of questions about your service. Did you wear your flak jacket? Did I wear the flak jacket? Mm -hmm. No. No, you didn't. It's very difficult to be in the turret with a flak jacket. Couldn't wear. How a, about a parachute? You no, wear. no. We. Uh, we, by we, I mean the engineers who flew the top turret in the combat zone, had uh, a harness and a parachute that clipped onto the harness. It took a little practice to get used to it, but it was always there. You couldn't stay in the uh, turret with it. There was no room for both. Whereas the pilot, co-pilot, navigator, radio operator, all the other personnel on the plane, they had the regulation shoot. Did they wear their flak jackets? You know something? I, I, I just can't uh, remember. Okay. All right. Um, what were your feelings when you uh, heard about the death of President Roosevelt? 
I heard about President Roosevelt. We were on a train going somewhere. You know, as I said before, yeah, that's okay. things are that. dim. Yeah. And I had been talking to a young lady on the same train who was a member of the WAC, the Women's Army mm -hmm. Corps. And because this was wartime, of course, the train was pulled off to a siding. And I remember that she came, got off the train. A couple of minutes later came back in a semi-hysterical state, crying bitterly. And we tried to calm her down. Nobody could figure out what it was. And I looked at the, head, the headlines on the newspaper and it said FDR dead. Mm -hmm. And I know this was somewhere in Arizona, one of those western states. Mm -hmm. so what was your reaction uh, to the dropping the atomic bombs? Well, thank God I want to go home to see my wife. <laughs> Um, did you ever make use of the GI Bill? No. How about the 5220 Club? I got a job almost immediately. Okay. Um, did you ever join any veterans organizations? I belonged to three different Air Force organizations. Eighth Air Force, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've resisted all the others. At that time, of course, being, coming out of service, didn't have neither the time nor the inclination to join. We had to worry about making a living. My wife had an excellent, excellent job, and I didn't want to be a house husband. Okay, did you ever, uh, you did mention you were in contact with one. Uh, did you stay in contact with any men that you served with? Uh, the pilot and co-pilot who are both alive. As a matter of fact, within the last month, I received a call from Andy Abernathy, who was the uh, co-pilot, mm -hmm. and he had had a stroke. He remained in service, and uh, but he had a stroke, and we were supposed to meet. But in the interim, my wife's illness flared up again, and we were forced to put our plans aside. Mm -hmm. And the, the uh, pilot, Jimmy Spratt, I received a rambling letter last Christmas, and that was the last I heard. A number of years after the war, after the war ended, that is, I uh, I had occasional uh, letter back and forth with the radio operator, and then one day I received a letter from him saying that his wife had suddenly passed away at a very young age, and. He didn't know how he could handle it. And that was the last I've heard of him. How do you think uh, your military service changed or affected your life? Well, a lot of pleasant memories. A lot of unpleasant memories. I, I don't know that it changed my life. These are all hypothetical uh, yes, questions, yes. you know. But, like I said, good things to think back and some harsh things. Did you ever get to see any USO shows when you were overseas? Uh, I saw Kate Kaiser. Bing Crosby was there once, and for some reason I didn't uh, see him. I will say one thing, though, going overseas on the uh, boat was mostly, as I said before, mostly African Americans. They put on shows that rivaled anything you would see on Broadway. Mm -hmm. Re real talent. Okay. Well, thank you.
thank you very much for your interview. It's well, thank, thank you. you. Now, can we <laughs> have a cup of coffee? <laughs> Would you like to?